It is really a delight and a privilege to be here this morning with you. And, you know, as I go on in life, um, when someone says, you know, she's been around a long time, like, it's true. Um, I realized uh, in the last couple of months, I did not know this, that I am officially a senior citizen by virtue of my age. Um, I don't really pay attention to that that much. And um, at Northbrook, one other thing that I do is I'm on their preaching team, and I remember when I joined the staff um, that our lead pastor said, it will be really, really nice to have an older voice um, on this team. So anyways, it's a good thing that I'm comfortable uh, in, my, in my own skin on that, but it really is a delight to be with you. Discipleship is a love story. And that's what we're going to be focusing on this morning. But I want to tell you just very, very briefly a little bit about the love story of my own discipleship, um, which um, Jesus kind of set in motion um, right at the time that I said yes to him. My whole family came to faith when I was in sixth grade. I have a twin sister. I have a younger sister. And my dad came. It's kind of a miraculous story. I won't go into it. But he came to faith in Christ, shared the gospel one night with my mother, the next three nights with each one of us, and it just made sense. Um, and And there we were. But as we grew in our faith together, which is very unusual to have parents and kids growing together, starting at the same time, one of the things that my dad, who, by the way, is the most unconditionally loving human being I've ever met, he was like that before I met Jesus, and that's only been enhanced as he's walked with Jesus. Um, And so the transition to trusting that God is loving um, was not that hard. And I'm very, very grateful for that. But one of the things that he shared with my sisters and I is that, girls, now that you're in Christ, you also have been given spiritual gifts. And he really encouraged each one of us as we went to college to pick majors that would be most congruent with our spiritual gifts. And which I did. And he also said, if for some reason you cannot get paid for that, um, the reality is you still have work to do by exercising your gifts in the context of the local church. Um, And I am here today as a result of what Jesus Christ did through someone like my dad. In the last seven years, um, I have gotten into a community of learners through the Wisconsin Center for Christian Study and NT Write Online. Um, And I can't go, I mean, I cannot embellish this in in any other way by saying that, and I'm not embellishing, but words cannot describe the kind of transformation, healing, shaping, and forming of my own theology, um, and therefore the ministry God has given me of teaching and preaching and caring for other people. And you will hear more of that um, in the sermon this morning. We're going to be spending um, time in the Gospel of John, in particular in John chapter 21, the second part of it, a little bit about the Gospel of John because the reality is we really cannot understand or make an application about what's happening in any particular text unless we understand actually what's happening in the Gospel itself and what's happening in in the context in which the Gospel is written. For most people, whether they're people of faith or not, John is considered a masterpiece of literature. Within the Christian Christian history and Christian community, the Gospel of John is considered the masterpiece of all of the Gospels. It was written some 20 to maybe 70 years after Christ. Um, It is clear from scholars who've looked at this that John was very, very careful to be mulling over and reflecting before he wrote this to be able to give us a very intimate picture of Jesus. There are stories in there that aren't in, in, in other Gospels and areas of focus that aren't in other Gospels as well. There are overarching sweeps in this gospel theologically, but there are also some of the most intimate pictures of Jesus drawing near and transforming lives of all kinds of people. John 20, 31 says this, These are written so that you may believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, is none other than Jesus, and that with this faith you may have life 
in his name. I think the text today, which is John 21, 9 through 19, which is the story of Jesus and Peter, after Peter's betrayal and after Jesus' resurrection, I think it captures in a really remarkable way the full picture of this love story of discipleship. And we'll look at that together today. I'm reading from a translation by N.T. Wright, which will be on the screens. It's probably a different translation than you're looking at in, in your Bible here. It's called the Kingdom New Testament. And I will read starting John 21, starting in verse 9. When they came to land, they saw a charcoal fire laid there with fish and bread on it. And Jesus spoke to them. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, he said. So Simon Peter went and pulled the net onto the shore. It was full of large fish, 153 in all. The net wasn't torn, even though there were so many. Come and have breakfast, said Jesus to them. None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the master. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so also with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus spoke to Simon Peter. Simon, son of John, he said, do you love me more than these? Yes, master, he said. You know I'm your friend. Well then, he said, feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, said Jesus again for a second time. Do you love me? Yes, master, he said. You know I'm your friend. Well then, he said, look after my sheep. Simon, son of John, said Jesus a third time, are you my friend? Peter was upset that on this third time Jesus asked, are you my friend? Master, he said, you know everything. You know I'm your friend. Well then, said Jesus, feed my sheep. I am telling you the solemn, tr solemn truth, he went on. When you were young, you put on your own clothes and went about wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you up and take you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate the sort of death by which Peter would bring, bring God glory. And when he had said this, he added, follow me. Holy Spirit, thank you for the alive and active nature of your word. May we set aside all that we think we know about you, about ourselves, about how you work, so that we can stay open to your transformative work in each and every one of us. Amen. This, this part of the story is set in a story. This is the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. John is very clear to let us know it is morning, it is sunrise. Whenever John does this, it is an indication this is like a new thing that's happening here. Sunrise always indicates that, at least in the Gospel of John. This would not have been the only time that the disciples had this experience of a miraculous catch of fish, um, but this time there's something different about it. There is a symbol in this story, a fire, but it's not any kind of fire. It's a coal fire. And there are two times in the Gospel of John, it's not in any, it's not said this way in other Gospels, there are two times that there is a coal fire that's burning and that's mentioned in a story, in a scene. The last coal fire was the one that Jesus was standing around when he denied Jesus the third time. And so Jesus is being very, very intentional as he and Peter go away from the other disciples and they are standing face to face with a, this coal fire burning in front of them. Have you ever had the experience where there is a sight, a smell, a taste, a sound that brings you back to a memory? These memories, these, these sensual things, these sense experiences can really lead us back to some really happy and joyous times, but also for many people, we know this now from all the research on trauma, that often the first time a person is able to go back to a traumatic experience that needs a healing touch is through a sight, a sound, a smell, a taste, a touch. And Jesus is being very intentional with Peter about having this coal fire. 
there would be a sound. There would be a feel of this fire. And there would be a smell. Jesus is not trying to re-traumatize Peter. He is not trying to beat Peter up with his sin, with his failure, with his betrayal, the breaking of a promise. This is love. Like, Peter, we have business to take care of here. Jesus never talked to Peter in this passage about the details of his failure. He didn't have to. Peter knew. This fire represents there is a failure here, and I know it's a failure. It's not hidden from me. But it's also representative, I know this failure, but Peter, I see you. And this betrayal is not going to define the rest of your life. The only time we have this kind of thing going on where Jesus intentionally uses something like this to bring one that he loves right back to their place of pain and failure and wounding and, and betrayal to say, I know, but I see you, and this will not define your life. And Peter clearly got that message we'll see as we go on. All of us have those places. And as ev whenever you come in contact with a sight, a sound, a smell, a memory, a person, a place that reminds you of what didn't go right, maybe that you perpetrated or that someone perpetrated on you or life just happened, I want you to picture your Lord and Savior right there with you, looking at you with love. I know, and this will not define you. We have work to do together. The fire. Then there's this very unique exchange. There have been many theories about why Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me, and then gives him three things to do, which are all very similar, you'll see in that text. And some of it has been, well, you know, Jesus, three, Peter betrayed Jesus three times, so Jesus needed to ask him three times, commission him three times. That may or not, may not be the case. We know that three is a kind of a sacred number in the scriptures, you know, three days in the grave and the third day he rose from the dead. But really what N.T. Wright is getting here in the translation is something that other translations have missed. And this is why we're grateful to have people that continue to look at and learn and interpret the scriptures, recover their original meaning. The first two times that Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? In the Greek, he is using the word agape meaning, are you all in? Do you love me uncon uh, unconditionally, Peter? And we see that actually something has changed in Peter already. He's getting very honest. And he does not answer with the Greek agape. He answers with phileo. I am your friend. I mean, like in the dating world, that would kind of be an awkward interaction. Hey, I love you. Thank you, but you're my friend. Okay? Two times Jesus asked him, do you agape me? And Peter answers, phileo. You'll notice that the third time that Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He actually says, are, are you my friend? He uses in the Greek the word phileo. Well then, are you my friend? This is a remarkable exchange that Jesus is willing to work with where Peter is at and doesn't say, go away and come back when you can love me by way of agape. I'll take what you have to give. There are many of you in this room today that can say you are all in unconditionally in your love for Jesus and service for him. There are probably others in this room that you have been there at one point in your journey, but you're a little uncertain right now. I've got some people I love very much in my life, 
that can say, I'm very intrigued by Jesus. I'm still interested from the distance, but I can't honestly say I'm all in. In this remarkable exchange, we see this love aspect, this love story of discipleship, that Jesus is open and willing to work with where people are at and still give them a purpose and a vocation. It's an amazing exchange. But there's also this surprising accommodation of Jesus in this that I've already started to talk about. And you know, people get very, very nervous when we talk about God accommodating certain things. That does not mean compromise. It does not mean that we ought to compromise or accommodate things that, that really matter. But it appears by Jesus' accommodation, taking what Peter has to offer and matching it, well, then we'll start as friends, even though you're not all in, and I'll bring you along. It seems that Jesus accommodates some things that might not matter so much to the degree that we think they are. It didn't matter so much to Jesus that Peter was all in. What mattered is that Peter was able to take the courageous risk of being honest and giving him what he could. Jesus can work with that. And then he also did this, Jesus did this thing. So not only did he accommodate where Peter was at and say, we can work with this, he also forgave him by giving him a commission. And sometimes when we talk about forgiveness, we really amputate it. We, we leave it at, I am forgiven for my sins, I am made new, and that is it. Done and over. That's where it stops. That is never how the New Testament ever talks about forgiveness. When there is forgiveness, there is always an energizing movement back into the vocation that a human being was designed from the beginning of time to fulfill. And we see that here. Well, if you're my friend, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Love my sheep. Take care of my sheep. There are hints of Genesis in this exchange and in this commission. Adam and Eve, the first two humans, were given something very similar. I want you to steward creation. I want you to work the land. I want you to produce and reproduce. I want you to be my image bearers and reflect back into creation who I am. And in essence, Jesus and Peter are starting again. And through this meeting Jesus where he was at with what he was able to give at the time, and that being enough for Jesus, he forgave him. And part of the forgiveness was saying, now, back to your original vocation. You are meant to work in my kingdom. And that is true for each one of us. There is not anything, if you are in Christ, that you have done, or any doubt that you continue to carry, any uncertainty that can define your identity will ever define your identity in Christ, and it certainly has no power to take away your purpose in Christ. And that is to continue to be his image bearer, feed the lambs, love the sheep, steward this place that God loves, and reflect back into the created order, the love, the mercy, and the forgiveness, and the new creation that's in Jesus. All around this fire. Can you picture yourself there? And then Jesus accommodating and embracing where Peter was at, and in essence forgiving him by inviting him right back into this meaning and purpose Peter had all along. It's an amazing story of love that energizes our call of discipleship. Well, Jesus certainly doesn't waste any time after that, staying all, I mean, he's very warm and fuzzy, and, you know, I'm not saying, like, he's weak, but there is a tenderness about Jesus here. But then we see a little shift in 21, 18 through 19, where Jesus makes it very clear, if you are my follower, 
you are going to be taking on the cruciform aspect of following me. And he says in verse 20, in 18 and 19, I'm telling you the truth, Peter. When you were young, you put on your own clothes and went about wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you up and take you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate the sort of death by which Peter would bring God glory. And when he had said this, he added, follow me. You know, most of us in this room may likely never experience what Jesus was referencing here for Peter. You know, anyone in the early church in those early days, and certainly many of our brothers and sisters around the world, even as I speak, are being persecuted, tormented, imprisoned, and executed for their faith and worshiping in secret. In the West, in particular in the United States, we may never ever know that, but you guys, there's no getting around it. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and the one true human was made perfect through his suffering. And part of the way that God transforms the world, sets things to right, is by his image bearers, you and I, also carrying the suffering of the world and also going through our own suffering and trusting the presence of Jesus to transform it and speak into it as we go along this way. I want to be very clear with you. I do not idolize brokenness. I do not worship brokenness. I do not idolize or worship suffering. But there is no getting around that as image bearers and people who carry a vocation to reflect the kingdom of God to the created order, we, like the one who goes before us, will have to carry our cross in big and small ways. I never liked this part of being a Christian. For the majority of my Christian walk, I have put that over here. Like maybe this meant something then that doesn't mean something now, but oh my goodness, did I get that wrong. And there was a real cost to getting that wrong that I can talk about another time. It's kind of frightening to think that taking on that cruciform form is part of discipleship. But it seems to be the sacred and mysterious way that God sets all things right. And we'll use that when he makes all things right knew. And he was letting Peter know that your betrayal won't define you. Your vocation still stands. And there are hard days ahead. But then he says two of the most comforting words in all of scripture. And that is, follow me. You see, part of the love story of discipleship is that when we take on this cruciform form of a suffering Savior and we hold the intercessions of lament for our own pain, for the pain of others, for the pain of the church, for the pain of the world, Romans 8 is very clear. It all works together. We're swept up in the groanings of the Spirit, the groanings of the Trinity, the groanings of the church. We don't have to figure out where all of it's going. We just know that there's something that's happening there. Jesus is not a trickster. He is not a person who baits and switches. He is not an abusive person that I'm only going to teach you things by way of hardship. Because Jesus is actually the one who himself came to us in the form of a human being. And Hebrews is very clear, this is a God who went through it all. There is nothing that you and I can experience, and I mean nothing, that Jesus himself, certainly in his earthly ministry, but no doubt when he became sin on the cross and took it into himself, this is a Jesus who went through it first and he came out the other side, and that is why he can say, follow me. I will be your companion every step of the way. He did not tell Peter how this was going to play out, but what he did say, it's going to be rough, but follow me. I am with you. Jesus is not a God who abandons us, and he is not a God who guides us from a distance. 
Brian mentioned that I have an athletic background. At some point, I'm hoping to get back into competition, um, but we, will, we shall see. I will tell you, though, that the people that have been the most helpful coaches in my life have been people who actually have themselves run the race. And people who don't just sit in a golf cart, which, by the way, many cross-country coaches do because they're too out of shape to be with their runners, and they shout through a megaphone um, to keep their runners on track and in the places that they need to be. My first coach was my dad. He did not sign up to be his coach. I chose him. I was third grade. He was training for a marathon. I had an interest in doing what daddy was doing. And I had a little windbreaker jacket, bell-bottom jeans, red Converse. I should have kept them all. Not that I would fit into them, but they're all back in style now. He was going out for a 20-mile run, training for the Boston Marathon. I said, Daddy, could I run with you? He said, of course you can run with me. But how about if you do a mile? You come out a half a mile, I'll tell you when that is, and you can turn around and go, and, and go back home. And yes, those were the days that you could send your kid home running, and it was quite safe. No fear at all. So I ran half a mile, he stopped, and he said, now you can run, run back home. And he looked at me and he said, Jenny, you know what? I think you could be really good at this. And that stuck with me. And I started competing quickly after that. I got into middle school and high school, I had a cross country coach, amazing guy, Chris Ramsey, someone in the first service actually ran against him. Chris Ramsey would do two a days with his runners in the heat of summer, all of August run every step of the way with us. He made sure that he'd go back and forth from the front of the pack to the back of the pack, making sure that he could make little adjustments, give us encouragement. On the cross country course, I was leading one time and I missed a flag. He said, Kaylor, go back, do the flag or you're gonna get DQ'd. Like he was just, he was just there, he was present. But he also knew the course because he did this many, many times over. My coach, sp sp uh, sprinting coach, Larry City, I still remember him getting down in the blocks with me, teaching me how to set my feet so I could get a slow burst up and out, and he would do that again and again. I remember during the Ironman, I had a coach in the pool that was a college swimmer. He swam as a master's swimmer, and he got in the water with me, and he said, Jenny, I want you to watch how I do this, and then I'm going to come over, and I'm going to show you how to adjust your stroke so you can be a little bit more efficient. It was amazing, and I'm going to tell you why this worked. It's because these are people who did it first. And these are people who, it's not just that they were masterful at what they did because that's how they started. They were masterful at what they did because of what they suffered and what they learned from others and practice over and over again. I will never make a one-to-one -one correlation between these coaches and Jesus, but it's the best illustration I have. When Jesus says, follow me, he is not just saying, here's your guidebook in the Bible, I'm leaving and get to it. He is with us every step of the way as one who made it through himself, discipleship, as one who followed the Father and made it through. There is no better comfort than that. Other places in the Gospels will hear, not just follow me, but watch me, learn from me, imitate me, keep company with me, take my yoke upon you. It's light, it's easier than the one you're wearing. I am with you. And then of course, at way in the, you know, before this, Jesus went to the cross. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm not gonna leave you as orphans. I'm gonna come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will remind you, lead you, guide you, love you, counsel you, empower you. We can't take on cruciform ministry in our vocation if we didn't have a Jesus who went through it first and says, I am with you. Just follow. This is the full love story of our discipleship. All of our wrongdoing, all of our shame, Jesus says, I know, and you know, and I see. It's not going to define you. And then I'm going to meet you where you're at. Give me what you have. We'll work with that. And then you have a vocation. Let's start where you're at. Let's get to it. Doesn't matter what skills you have, what skills you don't. Every human being, if they're in Christ, has a vocation. And we get to it. And then he lets us know, yep, there's going to be hard days ahead in this vocation. 
but I'll be there. Follow me. I'll be with you. Learn from me. I'll empower you. That is the full picture of discipleship. I want to leave you with one additional thought as we end. I've learned from this community I'm in that one of the best ways to get into gospel stories like this is to take some time of solitude and put yourself in the place of the main player who is face to face with Jesus. Think about that. It's very transformative. But the second thing is this. I have no doubt that there are people that you are and I am as well wanting to be able to invite to know Jesus the way I know Jesus. But they are at a very, very different place in their journey. And like I said, some of those are people I love very much. And I have been very challenged by this story to meet them as Jesus meets us where they're at, not where they're not, and let go of some things right now that just don't matter as I'm reflecting a loving, merciful Jesus to them who has the same vocation for them. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your love, for your presence, for the way that you surprise us, for the way that you use all of our experiences and our senses and our histories and our presence to continue to shape and form us into your image. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to nurture whatever nuggets of wisdom and truth you have given through this message today to form us more into your image so that we can reflect more powerfully the finished work in Christ to the created order that you love so much. It's in your name and for your glory that we pray. Amen.